So I'm reminded of a quote, which I have up here, so it's not like I just thought of it. It's on the slide. <laughs> uh, but it's a great quote. Nicholas Zinstrom. The telephone is a 100-year-old technology. It's time for a change. What we're basically saying here is if augmenting our reality is about trying to make that next leap, trying to make it so that the speed by which we gather information or disseminate it is faster or augmented, if our control over it is better than what it was before, if we accept Zinstrom's argument that the telephone is relatively old in its technology, and it is, although it's been enhanced, and we're always looking to try to make things better, what's next? What's the next telephone? Now, I think I have some ideas for this. We think we have some ideas for it. Other people are trying things like this. Uh, what I want to do today is show you what we're thinking of. We're trying to do something that's different, and we're trying, trying very hard to make the case that this is not science fiction. It, it, it is something that is, is realistic by how we're going to demonstrate it. Now, you may have seen this before. This is uh, it's actually it was at Fashion Week in, in New York. Uh, I like the idea because what they're doing is taking the phone and projecting it in front of your eye. But from my perspective, it's still the phone. So this is cool, but I, I want to go further. And for us, uh, where I work, we've tried really hard to go beyond just taking the phone and putting it in your eye. We've tried really hard to deal with these two issues. And that is, how do we deal with information and make it faster? And how do we make control more, you know, controlling? The user can take control of things in a way they can't now. In other words, no longer have me dial, pull things up, but maybe make that even faster. Right? Now, uh, our answer, we think, is also related to the eyes. And that's simple, right? And it's logical and it's neurological. The fact of the matter is that your eyes are faster than your hands. It's a peripheral issue. I can look at something much faster than I can look and then react with my hands. So we like the idea of eye tracking. We've spent a lot of time and energy on eye tracking because we believe at core, if we can figure out a way to let the eyes have more control, then that's probably going to be a good opportunity to enhance our reality because we're not having to use other things also along with it. Eyes faster than the hands. Now, other people have done eye tracking. This is the problem with eye tracking. Other people have done it, but they've done it in a research sort of way. Uh, they've looked into investigating things all the way from dyslexia, which is very important to understand, to how the body reacts to uh, the lack of uh, gravity. Uh, but what you see with this photo, or with this photo, or this photo, is that they're very kind of gadgety. They're very much interested in collecting research information, which is important, but that's not really going to affect everybody in the world. And that's what we're after here. You can't wear that walking around. Well, you could, but some things might happen to you. You shouldn't wear that walking around in the street. And it's got cameras in front of your eyes, and we don't want to do that. We want this to be something that you feel like you can wear, and it it's a part of your reality, it augments your reality, but it doesn't in any way hinder your reality. So these are great, but we try really hard to take that next step. So, and again, we, not, we don't want to just gather information. What was really important to us is that if it's really augmentation, it's not just about a phone screen in front of your eyes, it is quite literally your ability to control your environment. Before I could write a letter and send it, or I could call somebody on the phone. Now I can pull data up and bring it back down to me. What if we could control our world in ways beyond just our own physical limitations? What if we could enhance the ability to do that? Um, so this is our solution. It's called EG. EG is, as you can see right away, set up to be a device you can wear fairly easily. Now this one right here that I have as our first example is, a, uh, is a, uh, a gaming sort of tool. And the reason why I say that is uh, what we've came up, come up with initially is a tool that allows you to get audio from other people. It's got a microphone in it. It's mobile and wireless. There's no wires. You can wear it where you want to go. You can wear it. Uh, there's no 
cameras in front of your eyes. In fact, we use what we call a hot mirror. You can walk around and you will only see your world. There's a camera that records your world and shows you everything that's going on and anybody else can watch that camera too. But the camera also allows you to be able to gather additional data and you're not feeling as though somebody is controlling you or just gathering research for research purposes. Um, and this is what's really important for us, which we're going to demonstrate. I'm going to stress again, we've never done this before in a public sort of setting. We did it yesterday to practice, we've done it in our labs, uh, but we've not done it out here like this. What we've really worked on is not just gathering what the user sees and showing it to somebody, but we've worked really hard on control. And so what we're going to demonstrate today here is a couple of ways where control is clearly obvious. And so we're going to play basically a game, and then we're also going to hopefully fly that drone, all with our eyes, wearing EG. And again, I'm not aware of that happening before anywhere. There are other things that have been used to control them, but never, never your eyes. So what you're going to see now, Nathan has EG on. And he is going to play this game, and you can see now he is controlling the game with his eyes. That's why his hands are up. <laughs> and now, as you see, if you're a gamer, you're going to know right away how much faster this is. The speed by which he moves through the game. He is using his head to look, his eyes to aim. Now, he's still firing with his fingers, but we could, at some point, change that. If somebody needed assistive or wanted to just eliminate that, the only thing he's using his fingers now is to actually push the trigger. And as he moves through the space, things are much faster. They're natural for him because it is in an environment where he's not having to adapt to the technology. He's wearing the technology to adapt the reality to him. And we picked a first-person shooter game, obviously, because, well, it's cool. But also because you need speed. See how he moves through it. If you're a gamer, you're going to know right away just how fast he's moving. I think that's pretty cool. So why gaming, right, other than the cool factor? Gaming is a gigantic market. Uh, we've learned our lesson with this. Uh, we care very much about making this a tool available, for example, to people that have assistive needs. 20 plus million Americans can't use their hands or have limited hand functionality. We would love for this to be something that just makes their everyday lives better, but you can't change the fact that this cool factor is absolutely crucial. People like to buy things that everybody else has. They don't want to buy something that they think is accommodating. Uh, the gaming market is gigantic, and so if you can reach that market, it's terrific. The other reason is, frankly, if you can make this work for gaming because of the precision necessary, all the other factors, this will work on quite literally anything else that you could possibly imagine. Now, here's our next demonstration, and this is what I meant by working on quite literally anything else. It's really cool to be able to control things on the screen and with your eyes, so we've got that. The thing that we wanted to do, as I said before, it's absolutely necessary from the perspective of trying to go to that next level. We want to show that it's possible for a person to control objects in the world around them. This is kind of scary, because it's like an ESP thing, but it's not really. Corey does not have magical powers. Corey's wearing EG. That's object smart, this drone. So there's a way for them to communicate with each other. But there's no other way for me to talk about this other than to just get out of the way and have Corey show you how this works by just lifting it off and flying it. If you're lucky, he may just go ahead and shoot it off into the audience for you so you can catch it. Or maybe not. yourself on camera. It's looking at you as you look at it. That was cool. You see the screen, it's got a read out there, so one of the things that's really neat about that is that uh, um, not only can he do that, and I, I, you know, sometimes we, 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 we get so caught up in this we don't realize how cool it is. That's never been done before. Well, it was done yesterday. <laughs> but, you know, uh, 
you saw the readout. So the cool thing about the readout is that basically what that means is that uh, it, it can show somebody else what's going on. So if he's doing it, it, it shows the world that the that drone's seeing, and it's showing what Corey is seeing and interacting with. So you get the live data coming back, and then you also get the ability of this person to control it. And, and look, if we can control a drone, we can control... Well, that's really too big, so we're probably not going to control that. <laughs> that's probably, I was thinking about it, but one guy would do it, and it would cause problems, and we, we would lose our licenses or whatever. So a blimp is bad. But you can control things in between. And, 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 and that's really the point, again, is that the device allows you to record and bring back data that the user is seeing, but it also allows that user to control the world. And beyond that, which we did not demonstrate here, is that you can control what Corey is seeing with the device. So you could have, in the audience, we could have switched it to one of you, if you were wearing EG, Corey could be looking at it in London, and you could control it here in Lubbock with your eyes. Or the data could flow back to you from Corey, and he would give it to you, and you could get that data, which we saw on the screen. Or better yet, you could send stuff back to him. So at some point as he's walking around, and again, it's not interrupting your world, it's just like the phone, except control and the ability to send the data back and forth. The, the implications are enormous. Uh, coaches could instantly train their athletes. A quarterback could be wearing it, a golfer could be wearing it, something like that, instant training. Uh, doctors could diagnose patients. Again, I could control a robotic arm for surgery. My hands would be free for other things. I could also do that at a distance. Um, I could improve driving or flight. Uh, I could even, for law enforcement, first responders, even the military, make them safer, make us safer. Drones are a big thing now. All of those things have those implications, especially because of the cost we're trying to shoot for here. So really the entire point of this is that EG is not science fiction. Augmented reality, uh, and I argue with this in any sort of way possible, is not virtual reality. It's not something that's futuristic. Augmented reality is about human beings trying to make, to make the next step. How can we augment our reality and make it better? And, and for us, caught up in all this and demonstrating it to you, we believe this is a plausible first step. We believe we could make the case that EG might very well be, what is that next telephone? Thank you. <laughs>